of prayer. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather this morning to, to lift up our voices to the one who's the Savior of, of our souls. And we pray that it is well with our souls. We had the opportunity to wake up this morning. This is the day that you've made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Regardless of our situation, regardless of our circumstances, you still are Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And our eternity still rests in you. No matter what happens in this life, we know that we have eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And this is why we gather this morning that we might offer up our praise and worship to you. We pray that our hearts and minds are ready. We pray for this community that we might reach them with the gospel. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Just a couple quick things. Um, thanks for everybody. Yesterday is a good time. Thanks for Tom and Sandra for, for hosting us. Um, nice, nice barbecue and a good fellowship. So it's always great when uh, the church gathers together. I know how, how much we like to, to spend time with one another. Um, one thing that I didn't put on the calendar make a slide, uh, in case you weren't kind of around right at the last second, in on July the 27th, that Saturday, that evening, we'll meet here at the church and have a, a movie night. So we'll, we'll I think the the movie, is it called The Hill? Is that the one we decided on last night? Christian movie, The Hill. So, so July the 27th and that evening, Six, seven-ish, we'll put out time here in the next couple of weeks. So set that set that evening aside. We'll meet here at the church. Um, July 27th, it'll probably be a lot nicer inside the church than it will be on the outside of the wall. So, so we'll meet here that evening, time of fellowship. Uh, we'll gather together and, and just and have a Christian movie. Uh, there will be no men's prayer breakfast in July. Next week, it kind of follows falls into the kind of the 4th of July weekend. So we won't have it in July. Um, but we'll plan on uh, that first Saturday in August, we'll um, meet down at the kitchen table. So just plan on that, that the men's breakfast in August uh, down at the kitchen table. And I think that's really, that's all that's going in, in July. Uh, our scripture reading for this week, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 25. Sorry, yeah. Don't turn there. that mic on until I turn mine off. 1 yeah. Corinthians uh, 1, 25 to 31. Our sound system doesn't like when our mics cross. When our lightsabers cross. <laughs> <laughs> Verse 25. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards, not many were influential, not many were noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for sin for, excuse me, for us, wisdom from God, that is, our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord.
Psalm, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Dwayne, would you pray for us this morning? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to gather. And we are to complete us this message that we have to receive an offering that we have to give in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're in Luke 22, looking at verses 39 to 46 this morning. Jesus just gave his disciples one final warning about the persecution that's going to come before his own departure. In the months and years past, they were able to, to go about their own ministry relatively unharmed and unscathed. They were able to go from place to place, healing the sick. Carrying the disease, casting out demons with really little to no resistance. But Jesus has just told them that things are about to change. And the reason they were about to change was because of the cross. The cross changed everything. It changed human history. This one pivotal event turned everything upside down. We know that before the cross, everyone was dead. And their trespasses and sins, following after the prince of the power of the air, we were all children of wrath, just like the rest of mankind, as Paul says in Ephesians 2. But God, but God intervened because of the great love in which he had for us and made us alive together with Christ. And that was made possible by the cross. The cross is offensive to people. It's because sin is offensive to people. Not because their sin offends them. No, it's because the, su the suggestion that they even have any sin. And that the only way out of it is by putting their faith and trust in the man Christ Jesus who took that sin upon himself and had it nailed to the cross. That's what's offensive to people. <clears throat> Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.18, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those of us who are being saved, it's the power of God. Therefore, Jesus tells them, from now on, take your knapsack and your money bag and provisions. Be ready for resistance. Be ready for persecution. Take up your sword and now be ready for war. This wasn't a literal sword, but the sword of the Spirit, as Paul talks about in Ephesians 6, 17 and 18. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance. In that same chapter in Ephesians 6, Paul tells us about the armor of God that we're to put on. And he, he uses it as a metaphor because he wants to have us this visual picture, right? Our armor, our, this belt, this breastplate, our shoes, a shield, a helmet. He wants us to picture it, but it's used as a metaphor for what our true armor is. Our armor that we put on is truth and righteousness, the gospel of peace. It's faith and salvation. That's the armor that we put on. And the weapon that we yield is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And that word is offensive. 
So we must have the full armor of God on when we fight this battle. Paul goes on to say there in Ephesians 6, to put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to withstand the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. This is our enemy. And that's the enemy that Jesus was preparing his disciples for that coming reality as he goes to the cross. When we read there in Ephesians 6, the sword is not our only weapon. Paul tells us of another weapon that we have. And that's prayer. He says, take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. The sword of the Spirit that is the Word of God and praying in the Spirit always go hand in hand. Jesus just told them to ready their swords, and now he tells them to pray so that they might not enter into temptation. Our fight always begins and ends in prayer. In Luke 22, 39 to 46. And he came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat became like drops of blood falling to the ground. And when he had rose from prayer, he came to his disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, Why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. We have what's called here an inclusio. It's a grammatical device used by many ancient writers. It's used often throughout the New Testament. And it draws out emphasis. It's usually a word or a phrase that's used at the beginning of a statement. And then that same word or phrase is used at the end of the statement. And it serves as a sort of a parenthesis or brackets, kind of bookends. It's telling you what it's about. It ends it. And it tells you that everything that's going on in between is important. Here we have that in verse 40 and in 48. In verse 40, Jesus says, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And then he ends the conversation in verse 46, pray that you may not enter into temptation. It's the exact same phrase. So Luke is telling us what the emphasis is. It's prayer. Jesus begins his conversation and ends it with the same phrase. And then at the very center, Jesus is praying. And his prayer is that the will of God be done even if that means great suffering and sacrifice on our part. Sometimes that is God's will for us, suffering and sacrifice and persecution that flies in the face of the New Age prosperity gospel that gets preached so much. That God wants you to be healthy and wealthy. And if you're not, and if you don't have enough faith, you don't pray enough, you don't give enough. None of that's in Scripture. It's quite the opposite. Whose will be done? That's the question. My will or his will? That's what it always comes down to. That's a hard prayer. Not my will, but your will be done. Not what's best for me. Not works out what works out better for me in the long run. But what's best for the kingdom of God. And sometimes what's best for the kingdom of God is not what's best for us, in our own eyes at least. God's will doesn't align with our will. It's the other way around. Our will has to align with God's will. After the Last Supper, Jesus now leads his disciples out to the Mount of Olives, which was his custom to do. The word custom, it means his practice. This was his habit. When he was in Jerusalem, that's for he stayed quite often. We see that back in verse 37. 
in chapter 21. Every day he was teaching in the temple, but at night he went out and lodged on the Mount of Olivet, the Mount of Olives, which was his custom, his, his practice to do, which was pertinent information for Judas, isn't it? Back in verse 6, as he's conspiring with the chief priests, he consented and sought an opportunity to betray him, speaking of Jesus, to them from the absence of the crowd. And Judas knew exactly where Jesus was going to be, <clears throat> apart from the crowd. And Jesus knew that Judas knew. And Jesus didn't try to pull a fast one. He didn't go hide somewhere else. No, he went to the Mount of Olives. Jesus went to the place where he knew that they were going to come and arrest him, that they were going to beat him and mock him and scourge him and crucify him because that's what God's will was. Jesus is on his way to the cross and that path leads through the Mount of Olives. When we read the other gospels, they tell us that there was a certain spot on the Mount of Olives. There was a garden called Gethsemane. And this is the garden that Jesus now went to pray. It says Jesus went and his disciples followed him. That word disciple, it means pupil. It means student. It means follower. One of the literal translations of that word, methetes, in the Greek language is follower. Jesus left and his followers followed. Because that's what we're called to do. We are to follow him. We follow him to the garden to pray. We follow him in his righteousness and his obedience to the word of God. And we follow him to the cross. He tells us, if you want to be my disciple, if you want to be my follower, then you must deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. That's what it means to be his disciple. And as soon as they arrive in the garden, Jesus tells them, to pray. And the purpose of their prayer was so that they do not enter into temptation. This is how Jesus taught them to pray. Back in chapter 11, this is how he taught us to pray. Back in chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. Now when Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. As John taught his disciples, speaking of John the Baptist. He said to them, when you pray, say this, Father, hallowed be your name. And we see that's how Jesus begins his own prayer. Your kingdom come. We know that when we put it together with the other gospels, your kingdom come, your will be done. And again, that's what Jesus prays in the garden. For God's will to be done. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. For as we forgive everyone who is indebted to us, and lead us not into temptation. Jesus taught us to pray that. Back in verses 31 to 34 in Luke 22, Jesus had just told them that Satan wanted to sift each one of them like wheat, that they would all fall away, that when the shepherd struck, the sheep will scatter. We saw in Matthew and Mark version. He told Peter that he was going to deny him three times before the sun ever came up. And now he instructs them to go pray. This is the hour of the power of darkness, as he says down in verse 33, or excuse me, 53, when he's being arrested. We'll see next week. Therefore, pray. And when Jesus says pray so that you might not enter into temptation, it's then suggesting that when we don't pray, we are entering temptation. The opposite is implied. In fact, we are to specifically pray not to enter into temptation, as we just saw. Jesus says that when we pray, this is one of the things that we should always be praying for. So when we don't pray, temptation is always at our doorstep. It's always there. It's always lurking. Temptation and sin. God told Cain back in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 7, sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. 
Sin's desire is always for us, and it's always crouching at the door. Again in Ephesians 6, when Paul tells the church to put on the full armor of God, he concludes it there in verse 18, which we've read already, with taking up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Four times in that one verse, Paul urges the church to pray, which is the word of God, praying at all times, that's the first one, in the spirit, with all prayer and supplication. The word supplication means petition. It's another word for prayer. Paul says prayer with prayer. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication or petition or prayer for all the saints. Four times. Paul's urging us to pray. Pray at all times with perseverance, he says, because temptation is persevering after you. Satan, we know, is like a roaring lion, seeking whom he might devour. He's always seeking, he's always lurking, always crouching at the door. So pray that you might not enter into temptation. Then we see that Jesus goes a short distance away from his disciples and kneels down and prays himself, which is kind of an unusual cross posture. Standing was the ordinary custom when one prayed. In Matthew and Mark, it says that Jesus fell down to pray. We see this is the great strain that's upon him at this moment. Standing was customary. It's interesting to see that when you get to the book of Acts after the resurrection several times, it says that they fell down to their knees in prayer. Peter fell down to his knees. Paul, Stephen, as he's being stoned, falls to his knees and prays that the Lord doesn't hold what they're doing against him. The strain was upon him. At that moment was the cup of wrath. Jesus prayed. Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. It's the cup of God's judgment, the cup of his wrath. We see here, this isn't a moment of weakness. This is a moment of clarity. He made him to be sin, who knew no sin. And that was about to become Jesus' reality. He was the perfect and spotless one. He was the sinless one. And he's getting ready to be stained with the sin of the world. And he's going to experience the full wrath of God for it. If there is another way to remove this cup, that cup of wrath. But Jesus knew that there was no other way. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Whose will be done? There's always two wills. Our own will and then there's God's will. The question is, whose will be done? To be in complete submission to the will of God, regardless of the circumstances or outcome. It's easy to say, your will be done when the outcome seems great. Did I get the Ferrari or the Porsche? Not my will, but your will, will be done. Okay, Lord, I'll suffer with the Ferrari. It's not so easy when mocking and beating and scourging and crucifixion and death is what comes next. Father, is there any other way to satisfy your judgment for sin? Is there any other path that leads to the redemption of sinners? Is there some other solution to make this creation of ours righteous? And the answer was no. There was no other way. Therefore, not my will, but yours be done. That's why it says there in the Isaiah 53, 10, as we've read several times, Isaiah 53, that great chapter of the suffering servant 
In Isaiah 53, 10, it says, Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. And he's put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. It was God's will to do it because Jesus' life made the offering for our guilt. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And it's by his wounds we are healed. And that's why it was God's will to crush him and began and it ended with prayer. We bring our petitions to God with all prayer and supplication, but ultimately it's not our will we pray, but God's will be done. Luke's the only one that tells us that angels come to minister to Jesus in order to strengthen him, and that his anguish was so severe in his prayer that sweat fell from his face like drops of blood. And when he had finished praying, he came to his disciples, whom he left to pray themselves. But he found them sleeping from sorrow. They were informed that they were all going to flee. Peter was told that he was going to deny Jesus three times. And when we read through John's gospel, over half of John's gospel is about the last night of Jesus' life. It goes into great detail. Jesus is telling them that he's about to go away. And where he's going, they cannot follow. And it says that they became very sorrowful. And in their sorrow, they went to sleep. Again, in Isaiah 53, it tells us that Jesus was a man of sorrows. He was well acquainted with grief himself. Yet in his sorrow, he went to pray. So Jesus tells them again to rise and pray. It's the same word that's used for Jesus. In verse 45, it says, he rose. And in verse 546, when it tells, it says, rise and pray. It's the exact same word there. Jesus rose from prayer. And now he tells the disciples to rise and pray. Pray that you might not enter into temptation. Satan wants to sift us all like wheat. So we must pray that our faith does not fail. Jesus prays for us for that very message, just as he does for Peter. But we need to be a part of that prayer too. We need to pray that our faith does not fail. We need to pray that we don't fall back into sinful behaviors, back into our sinful patterns, that we don't fall into temptation. The devil sets snares for us. He sets traps for us. And when we're not paying attention, we can easily fall into them. Peter didn't fall to his knees in prayer. He fell down and went to sleep. And his hour of betrayal was about to happen. The other disciples didn't go fall down in prayer. They too went down and fall asleep. And now they're all about to be scattered. Satan's going to sift them. Prayer is part of our preparation for battle. Part of our weaponry. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and praying in the Spirit. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That's our weapon. And if we don't know the word of God, then we don't have any sword to fight a war with no weapon. It's hard to fight a war if you don't have a weapon with you. And if we don't pray, then we enter temptation. We lose the battle ever before we even get on the battlefield. Scripture tells us that we have everything we need available to us to fight these battles that we're in each and every day. But if we don't utilize them, if we don't know how to use them, then we'll be fighting a losing cause. Not a losing war, the war's already won. Christ already did that when his sin and death, that should give us encouragement that the war is already won. It should give us encouragement to go fight the battles, knowing that the outcome of the war 
And we still fight these battles each and every day until Christ comes to claim his final victory. So Jesus tells his disciples to be ready, to be prepared to put on the full armor of God, to arm yourselves with the sword of the Spirit and be fervently in prayer. And when we do this, the devil cannot withstand can't withstand our attack and he flees from us. That's what he does. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Prayer is necessary. It's a tool in our fight and we have to be able to wield it. Scripture tells us of two gardens and two different wheels. In Genesis, the first garden, the Garden of Eden, where both Adam and Eve are tempted by Satan and they ultimately fall and they ultimately fail because it was better to them that their will be done and not God's. Satan tempted them to question God's word and when they heard that they won't die, instead their eyes will be open and they'll be just like God. That sounded much better to them. So they did their own will and fell into sin. Now Luke tells us of another garden. And it's a garden that Jesus was in. And Satan was still there crouching and tempting as well. And Jesus is praying. Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Satan told Jesus that he was willing. Back in chapter 4. Satan gave Jesus a way to not drink that cup. Jesus is praying, is there a way that I can't drink this cup? Satan said, yes, there's a way. If you fall down and worship me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. Satan offered Jesus a path to the kingdom without the cross. But Jesus didn't fall into temptation. Not my will, but yours be done. The two different gardens and the two different wills. Satan was always tempting he tempted Jesus to do his own will and offered him a way out of it. The easy way. But Jesus refused. Instead gave that will back to God even though it meant persecution and death for himself in order to fulfill the word of God. Sometimes God's will for us isn't what we believe is the greatest thing for us, but we do it nonetheless because that's the betterment for the kingdom. Father, we thank you for this time this morning as we gather together in your word. We're thankful for your son. He not only teaches us to pray and what to pray, but he gives us an example on how to do it. That even in difficult times, knowing that a difficult outcome we still submit ourselves to your will, regardless of what will happen. Because it was your will. It was your will to crush him at that moment for the redemption of our own sin. We pray for the encouragement that when we come to those own times in our life, that when we will be tempted to do what's best for us or to do our own will, that we too will submit ourselves to your will. Even when the outcome might not be all that great, we know that it's for the betterment of the kingdom. That your ways are not our ways, your thoughts are not our thoughts. That you know the beginning of history to the end of history, and we're just but vapors in the wind. But we're still grateful that we can be used for your cause, to be used for your son, to be used for your kingdom. We pray for guidance and direction to be able to do that that we might bring glory to you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Whose will be done? Almost every situation we find ourselves in, we find ourselves asking that very question, whose will be done? Our own will or God's will? Oftentimes we like to talk ourselves into doing our own will because it always sounds better and works out better for us. We think that if the if the outcome or the, the situation is bad on the other side, then that must not be God's will. 
So we'll choose a different way or a different path. We see that we have encouragement from the Lord on how to pray. That even though the situation on the other side might not be all that great, we still do it and face the persecution or the consequences on the other side in order for God's will to be done. I'd like everybody to please stand. We're going to worship through song one more time and we'll see everybody back again next Sunday for Sunday school and our time of worship. <coughs> Yeah. I know. I know that's true. 